With that, thank you very much. I'm going to go very quickly here. Walter actually set the stage kind of nicely. I'm an agricultural climatologist, and we do everything tactical and practical in real time. So I want to start off just with something you already know, but it helps me set the stage a little bit. One of the manifestations of what's happening with a warming atmosphere is, is very straightforward from an agricultural perspective. Things are hotter, wetter, colder, and drier. In other words, it's the variability. And that variability is always bad for agriculture. Even a semi-arid, almost pastoral situation is expecting things to be a certain way. And if it's different from that, it's never good. Even if the season is, you could say, wait a minute, it could be really good. I agree, but they're not set up to take advantage of it. And you see the problem there. You see the variability impacts expectations tremendously. So this is about food security. I flew in yesterday, <laughs> it was very late um, this morning uh, before I got here, but from a DC food security panel, because this is becoming something of tremendous import. And I was quite struck by what we just heard because I can invert the equation a little bit. We can find areas where there's an acute issue and we use satellite data, we're combining with a company that does do this, to find out some of the other specifications and the spatial extent of it. Because sometimes the problem is subtle and isn't gonna be available from certain sensor platforms. Nighttime warmer temperatures can move you into conditions conducive for foliar diseases. These things hammer yield and it's not necessarily going to be seen in a spectral imaging. It actually can be at a very, very fine. You see field guys with spectrometers. But the point of fact is it's a complex problem, and it's spatially extensive, very expensive to search for the problem. So you use orthogonal data to find where to look more closely. And these are things that start to get optimizations that's happening today. So what I would just want to throw some of these things out here, because this is just us. This is the way we go about dealing with things in the world. This is, uh, I'm going to step through what we've created. We use a lot of NOAA data. We use data from all over the world. What we try to create, though, is a standard, what we call a current, correct, consistent, and complete data set. It's all available through an API. It fits exactly this kind of connectivity between multiple environmental types of problems, and it's available now. So everything starts with observations, right? You have ground stations. I'm headed to Mali on Sunday, so this happens to be things I'm thinking about. Um, and you have, you have ground stations that are, you know, WMO qualified, and you have ground stations that we just call agromet stations. These are useful things to augment otherwise very scientifically, very expensive data collection. You augment with things on the ground, right? You do ground survey, and I'm gonna to touch on that in a, in a little bit as well. So what we do is we take those irregularly spaced stations, and we create this, think of it as a weather station every nine kilometers over the entire agricultural earth. There's about, I don't know, 1.8 million, okay? And what we've done is we take the satellite remote sense data, we mash it all together, we have some exclusive stuff out of uh, CSU, Colorado State, for uh, some hourly rainfall that augments existing. And then behind every one of those rainfall grids, which happen to be at about five arc minutes, so about nine kilometers by nine kilometers, we build an entire set of min-max temperature, humidity, all the other data, so you can calculate evapotranspiration and run all your crop models. And that means that if you build, so Monsanto, if they build an app, that hits the data and works great in Iowa. If you just change the latitude and longitude, it'll work in Nicaragua, it'll work in China. So it scales, and this is where we start to offer things. So I'm um, uh, Terry, and I met, we're on a, I'm on a committee, we're trying to work with Silk here in, 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 in Boulder. We're trying to make these data community of practice. We heard about this wonderful ecosystem of users. We do the same thing. We have hackathons. There's one going on right now in India. We've done them in Ghana. We've done them in, in, uh, in Kenya, because a lot of people don't yet realize they can solve business problems with these kinds of data. So this is, we're very much oriented. We have a lot of customers in the US too, but we do a lot of things overseas still. I lived in Kenya for five years. The obvious point is if all you have are irregular stations, your ability to say something going on is something as important as to a farmer would be useless. So if you do what we do, you have something that's far more realistic. And we actually start off doing research prioritization work. And what we do is we take all that satellite data, you stack it up. All this makes great sense to you all because from the remote sensing side, that's what you have. You have a data cube. You have a ton of data about a location. What are you going to do with it? We emphasize time series because agriculture is all about the integration since the day the season started to today, what growth stage is, what does that temperature pressure cause on the plant today it could be very different than a different growth stage. So if you think of this blending process, we produce a really good global product for rainfall and then we tuck all this other data underneath it so that we can actually target. And I'm going to show you something that's happening in West Africa uh, today. 
So part of this targeting means we cover the agricultural earth. It's available. You can run your crop models. There's daily data in a form that you'd be used to using. And at any time, you pull in other data to augment what you're doing. But the spatially extensive nature of agriculture, particularly when you start talking human security in some of these semi-arid vulnerable areas, there's an, I read recently there's an expansion of the um, Hadley cell, for those of you who have any kind of climatology. What we're saying is there, since there's more heat in the atmosphere, more is rising off the tropics, well, where it descends, that's the Earth's deserts. If that's getting bigger, I will tell you right now, the Middle East crises of human refugees is not going to go away. Okay, Morocco's winter wheat crop is about 60% lower than average. It didn't rain. These are serious issues for food security. Everything's through an API. We heard enough about APIs. Basically, uh, we're not quite on AWS yet because they still charge what we do too much for a company. We're an emerging company, 25 employees. We're getting there. We, we're just over in Broomfield. For those of you who are uh, Boulder based, it's literally 15 minutes. Kind of nice. Where's Broomfield? Uh, well, it's a small <laughs> town. <laughs> but I want to make a point. No, it's not as far as Nebraska, it's before the airport. <laughs> Here's some evidence of impact, guys, that probably is a little different. So smallholder farmers, I will say this, this is the most influential piece of technology humans have ever created. Why? Because everything in here that you know, that your knowledge, if you can distill it down to an actionable piece of insight, it can go to a pastoralist Maasai in the eastern drylands of Kenya. And that guy can go, oh, I need to take my cattle that way because it rain fell over there. And they do that now. Now that is impact. Yes, fire was a cool thing. Wheels are nice too. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, when you can connect your brain to somebody in Niger, that, that is, brings humans much tighter together. Okay, really quickly, we're not just overseas. This is one of our commercial companies. This is all the data they pulled in the last month. And these are farmers in the US. Across the ag value chain, we're going to hear from Risk Pulse. We actually do some similar kinds of things. I think we could actually work together rather well. <laughs> because I heard earlier, we don't just have a sample of the weather, folks. We have the population. When we talk about sugar, we are right on. We've been predicting the sugar price increase. Data, you have apps, you need tools. Our mistake was we thought APIs were really easy for everybody to use. It turns out that it's not quite that way yet. You still need to provide a lot of stuff, preferably actually a layer of insight, where people actually just buy the answer. They don't want to own the imagery. They don't want to own all the data. They just need to know what their problem is. We're in that space too. Little examples of tools that drill in. This is looking at Mali last year. Well, what's cool about this is they had good rains. That would be good to know from a food security because just east of there, they didn't. So this is cool. This is just a GIF. It's current to Sunday. Look at this, what I call a pocket drought. Here's another one. And there's actually one over here too. This is live weather data. It's updated current to yesterday, eight-day forecast. It's available globally, et cetera. And you see what we're getting at. You can target now what's going on in an area where you're seeing civil unrest. You can even target interventions. The Peace Tech Labs are about this. This is last year. This is a really good sorghum growing area. It failed miserably. But it's a pocket drought. Didn't hit the news. But this is what hit. All those people left there. This is where they're seeing refugees. And you notice where it's blue? That's where the rains were good? This is where Boko Haram, because every people, from the Vikings to the Comanches, knows if you live in a semi-arid area, you're a raider. And you're not going to raid someplace where it didn't rain. They're going to raid someplace where they have something worth taking. This is serious stuff. Um, final comments here. Weather variability is increasing food demand. We know population. Quality is important. I know the title of this was all about the feedback, but here's the point. Everything we do makes our data available to people who are taking it very personally on their farm. Even the API is suddenly optimized for one thing, and they're saying, well, I want to drill in and pull 10 years out. I need to do this now. And so the point about the feedback is it makes it more accurate. The more we are told that we missed rainfall, because we had actually a problem. One of the birds fell out of the sky last year in the um, now I'm forgetting, sorry, I'm really tired. Um, and, and, and the algorithms that estimated rainfall from that missing, they tried to correct and they, they did all right, but there was a latitudinal band across the southern hemisphere that they overestimated the rainfall. We were told that right away. So we correct it, so everybody gets better data. So this idea of a community is really important and it really helps make things more accurate. And my, the reason why I want to bring it up here at this slide, some of you may have read this, Anti-Fragile by Nassim. 
What's stunning about this is what he says is that the health of complex systems requires feedback. All of you are pretty healthy individuals. If you went home and went to bed for 30 days, you would be sicker and weaker. You have to move around, you have to exercise, you have to pull. So in our world, we know we need to hear back from users. I want students to tear into this and say, that can't be. I want scientists to say, I've got 80 field trials, how come you missed on these three? Sometimes we're not gonna catch a microclimate and can't afford to try to. And sometimes we have a mistake we can fix and when we fix it, it cures it for a whole area. And this is a very exciting part. You also have to be a little more humble. You also have to be not so proud so that you don't release your data until it's perfect because there's no such thing. Stick with excellent, that'll work, <laughs> okay? And that's uh, kind of the end. This is where we do our studies and that's it. So thank you very much for an incredibly brief time. Oops, oh, now I've ruined it. Apparently this. Great, thank you. I'm Steve Harvard from Ball Aerospace. I administer all of our internal R&D for Ball, and as a consequence of that, I can give you a little bit of insight into my views on the next generation of remote sensors. And so I found a convenient framework to deliver what I'm seeing is a discussion of the types of resolution that sensors provide. And I define the types of resolution as spatial, temporal, and spectral. Spatial is the resolution that we're most familiar with. It's intensity versus position. Spatial resolution allows you to very accurately count cars in a parking lot if it's high enough. Here you have an example of a meter to two meter spatial resolution, the same parking lot at 31 centimeters, and you could see I could give you an exact count of cars at this resolution, whereas at a meter to two meters, it's guesswork. So in the past, the last couple of decades, spatial resolution has been the focus of the industry of the folks who produce new remote sensors. We can go back and we look at Iconos, which is the, uh, the, commer the first commercial remote sensing satellite for geospatial intelligence. And it was a meter, a couple of meters, spatial resolution. Then we got to QuickBird and we started getting down closer to a meter in the late 90s. GOI and ultimately Worldview 3 are down there at 31 centimeters now. So that's been the trend over the last couple of decades. Where we're going today, I think, is a little bit different. I do not expect to see this trend continue. If it were, this couple meters to a meter to a few tens of a centimeters would get us down to maybe a few centimeters of spatial resolution in another decade or two. I don't think that's going to happen. So going forward, what I'm expecting to see is temporal resolution in the near term. And Walter alluded to this proliferation. Not just of big cameras in space, but cell phone data, Twitter data, proliferation of data to allow us to not only count cars in the parking lot, but then to determine how fast they're moving in and out of the parking lot. That's the hole that exists today that I see being addressed with the next few years of research by sensor providers. And then a decade, two decades from now, where we're going? Spectral, intensity versus wavelength, as opposed to intensity versus time or intensity versus position. Why is spectral so important? Walter, again, hinted at this. He said, if you're looking at vegetation and you're looking in the visible green, 550 nanometers, you see green. Is that vegetation alive? Is it dead? It's green. It's not absolutely obvious. But there are other bands, just a few hundred nanometers away, where active photosynthesis is shown. If you go just to 900 nanometers, you'll see the same exact picture. This is Alabama in 2011. Northeast of Tuscaloosa, a tornado came through, killed 250 people. If we were to take a picture of where the tornado came through, just afterwards, in the visible at 550 nanometers, it's all green. But at 900 nanometers, we can see the difference between photosynthetically active green and photosynthetically inactive green. 
and we can actually trace the exact path of the tornado. So that's what spectral does for you. Okay, so going forward, <clears throat> the trend. And again, I heard all this from Walter. Proliferation and fusion. Distributed assets out there doing remote sensing, but also in our pockets, maybe in our cars, those sensors in our cars provide. And I've heard this story from domestic companies, domestic government agencies, international companies, and international government agencies. They like the, special res the spatial resolution they've gotten over the last three decades. What they're missing is the temporal. Where does it come from? Again, Walter gave us all this information as well. Storage, data processing, data movement, and autonomy. The ability for sensors to make decisions on their own. We don't have to have a bunch of people with clipboards making decisions for our sensors anymore the way we did a decade, two decades, three decades ago. We heard all about what we can do with data storage. 80 petabytes, unthinkable, not that long ago. And so I gave you some graphic representations to allow you to, to see temporal resolution graphically. And also I found this interesting. It's a little bit dated, it's from NASA. The most frequent current uses of satellite data in the continental United States. Kind of interesting, and it's, it's land use, not too surprisingly. Okay, my last slide. Graphic representation of what I just told you. Spatial resolution, Worldview 3, 31 centimeters. Skybox, their imagers are around a meter, and the doves from Planet Labs are three to five meters. So you can see the spatial resolution. We've been giving that up over the last few years as the trend has been away from monolithic, exquisite, but singular systems like Worldview with very high spatial resolution, but also very low temporal resolution. You want to take the same picture with the entire Worldview constellation? It's going to be a couple of days. With Skybox, maybe one day, and with Planet Labs, maybe as little as an hour. So that's where you get this temporal resolution. Where we're going from here? We want to retain that high spatial resolution that we've worked so hard to achieve, and we want to combine it with the high temporal resolution that we can get from proliferation and fusion. So the challenges are to enable proliferation, and that's what gives us the higher temporal resolution, and combine it with the ability to do data fusion, and that's what will allow us to retain the high spatial resolution. So that's what I see for the future. Guys, so one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of him. Yeah. I mean, and then uh, just give me a second to get back to that. Sure. Question mark. <laughs> uh, let's see. I know it's plugged in. All right. Actually, I know it's plugged in. I don't know why it's not picking it up. I mean, it's, is this plugged in in the right place? Yeah, sometimes. It's My computer detected the change, but this thing is not. All right. Um, I have one other adapter which I can try. I don't think it's that problem, though. It's detecting it. Let's see. Um, let's just see. I've got it at VGA as well. Yeah. Hold on one second. Haha. -ha. Another sinner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm. 
us developers. This is in Austin. Yeah. This is old. Yeah. Austin's weird. All right. Oh, there it is. Oh, no. Don't make me go back. There we go. Yes. <laughs> oh. Got a little bit of waviness, but that's all right. All right, that'll work for me. Okay, um, so maybe the way I'll start this out is by saying I've, uh, I've heard a lot of, I've heard a couple different tracks here so far mentally as I think about data. One is this uh, incremental progress that's happening, which does unlock big gains. The other one is, um, you know, I think uh, John hit on this when he mentioned, you know, wheels fire and mobile phones. It's this zero to one non-incremental change. So, you know, a huge transformation that's happening because of some fundamental technology that's, that's being introduced. And lo and behold, um, supply chain is a place where, so what do we do? We, we create supply chain intelligence primarily from weather data. Um, and I got into this uh, personally because I was, grew up in South Florida, obsessed with weather as a kid, and then ultimately started a software company. And I said, you know what? Weather data is just an incredible data set that's not being properly used. And properly used for me at the time meant, how far away is this hurricane from my home? Because <laughs> um, the weather, the guy on the local news is not telling me that. In fact, he's standing in the way of, uh, of what I'm trying to look at. So super frustrating. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then after that, went to school and became a software developer. And I said, oh my gosh, I'll never forget the fire and, you know, the, the, the lightning in the bottle or the fire moment of, uh, you know, that Prometheus moment of saying, I've got weather data in a database and I've got a blank canvas and I have a problem I get to solve. Um, so thank you, Noah, for, for lots of great weather data that lets us uh, solve these problems. Um, <clears throat> but supply chain is a zero to one space, in my opinion. So what we've learned in going out to people in the field, and as you'll see a couple examples here in a minute, um, they're still, many of them, when I went into a client or prospect back in uh, probably 2011, still looking at weather.com. I'm not saying that's a zero, but going to weather.com, putting their finger on a map, and for their purposes saying, I've got a supplier that ships mission critical parts to my plant in Alabama, and they're about here, and if I turn on the radar layer, I think it's gonna be snowy, what, is that, what do I need to do about it? And that's the, that was the state of the art of supply chain risk management at a $50 billion automotive manufacturer at the time. Um, and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> this is, this is, it, all of these guys in here would say that is so far in the past that you know, maybe, it is a, maybe it is definitely a zero to one. So, so, so what does that mean we do? Um, su for supply chain, weather, and I'd say external risks, is an unoptimized variable. So they, ver they optimize for fuel prices, for inventory, for... Uh, market demand and surges and all of these things they've optimized for, freight prices. But how does weather and external risk data impact those decisions? Um, largely that variable is just set to zero or, or null and they say, we don't know, we're gonna check the weather channel or whatever it is beforehand and make the best decision that we can. Um, so what that creates is issues like this. So Hershey's is having a, uh, a bad time shipping chocolate because it keeps melting and how many ice packs do we need to use to get it to a customer um, at a price that we can afford. Um, and then of course you, you always have your black swan events, I'm a Taleb fan as well, um, that really mess up supply chains and we hear about those in the news. But there's actually a, there's a spectrum here from temperature conditions that are variable to, to these extreme events. And one thing I was gonna point out, um, which was uh, also mentioned by John here, is that just because you have a good year, so this winter was very mild for these supply chain guys mostly, but guess what? they run off of heuristics that were established by the previous 20 years of time, and December is usually really, really cold. So guess what? We're gonna do all of our cold weather prep and all of our cold weather operations, and that's really expensive. If you were in a lot of these states this December, you didn't need to do any of that. But they don't have a tool that lets them trigger different workflows because we have a very warm December, right? Um, and that's costing millions of dollars, by the way, so it's not a, these are not small, small decisions. So where is the opportunity, as I already hinted, spending too much on freight, damaging cargo, and then not keeping promises to customers in terms of service um, and, and getting it there on time, lost sales. You know, another example maybe on a consumer level is if you've used Uber or Lyft, and if you're in Austin, you will not be anymore for a while, um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, it's a surge pricing, right? And, and weather plays into that to an extent. And the way we think about this is as we go to market, and I think this is a go-to-market talk more than a technology talk, although I'll show you some things here in a minute that have, you'll see 
charts. Um, really, it's, it's, there's a lot of artificial demand and supply for logistics services. Um, and I say artificial because they haven't taken the weather into account. So Uber really is at a cutting edge in that sense of saying, you know what, consumers may hate it sometimes, but we're going to get more drivers on the road uh, to drive for people when the weather's bad because more people want drivers then. And we're going to calculate that into our pricing and we're going to increase the price and that's going to solve the equilibrium problem that we have in terms of the marketplace. That same problem that we experience on our smartphones is experienced within transportation management systems of uh, manufacturing companies, consumer packaged goods companies, when they say, it's December, we need to use temperature controlled freight or shipping. And they don't actually. Their demand for that is artificial. It's, it's propped up by bad data or intelligence that they have, which really isn't intelligence. It's 10 years of this is the way we always do it. November 1st, we start shipping with reefer units, and April 1st, we stop. Um, but what that costs them is a fortune, and the gap between what they really need to spend and what they're spending um, is millions of dollars, and that's just, that's just one example. Um, so, but these are avoidable. Um, the data is there. And so, so how do we do it? Um, I like the metaphor data is the new crude oil. Somebody said data is the new oil, and I was like, OK, it's a commodity. But I think really data in a lot of the context here is it's, it's raw and it's unrefined. Um, so how do we, Risk Pulse as a company, refine data? Well, the first thing is you have your oil fields, if you will. Um, so weather and environmental data over here, and then hardware, smart hardware, IoT you could call it, um, that's logistically oriented, smart pallets, um, sensors that are on trucks, et cetera. That's one place you bring in what we'd still consider raw data. Um, you can put a big NOAA logo right here. Um, and then customer segments, they bring their own data to the party, so it's BYOD. Um, they've got a ton of data on their network, supply chains, uh, dependencies, who ships what to where, where my parts come from, etc. Problem is, that those, not, those haven't been intersected in a way that they can actually change workflows with. So how do we do that? Um, so we bring in the supply chain data, so that's asset locations, transportation lane shipments. Um, we currently monitor about 11 million miles of, of highways and rail. Uh, for our customers, about 50,000 locations. And we also have the mappings of dependencies between those nodes. So if one of them is freezing, how does that affect downstream uh, you know, behavior and operations? They're bringing all this. This is what's typically in a TMS or a supply chain management system. You know, Oracle has this, SAP has this, usually on-premise um, storing this data. Where we come in and, and where, how we fuse these is this idea of a, a risk taxonomy and profiles. So um, it's not rocket science, but a risk taxonomy essentially allowing our clients to browse a catalog of all the available data. And the trick here is not that you want to give them, and somebody talked about the difference between choosing and then a drop down and then a search, right? Um, the, it, it's a little bit more than that in our, in our application because, you know, think about the person who says, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just when things get really cold and freezing and, and blizzardy, right? That's when I have issues. And I've got claims data to prove it. But they're not going to sit there and talk about, you know, what was the minimum temperature on a daily basis for last, you know, whatever. They're not thinking, uh, you might say, scientifically. So we as a community, as scientists, have deconstructed all of the phenomena that we observe, created models, and then we reproduce data or produce data out of it, which is very fragmented and siloed. And unless you understand the data itself, you have a mental taxonomy, you don't even know where to look, what different parameters to pull together. So a good example of this is, uh, if you're, if you're an architect in South Florida, which my dad was, you know that maximum sustained winds, so the average wind speed at two minutes, has a big impact on structural you know, integrity and, and whether or not your roof is going to stay on. That's something that architects and, and civil engineers have learned over time in these affected areas. A supply chain person doesn't even know that. <laughs> so you have, to bring, you have to give them the ability to say, high wind. And then you say, well, do you mean, right? Wind gusts, sustained winds, winds over time. Maybe you mean high winds after you've had a lull, but you had high winds before that. Very complicated, right? But it's not something that they have the time or the expertise to, un to dig through and understand. So we create this taxonomy. Um, think of it as a periodic table, if you will, of conditions that I might care about. And then profiles, which is um, ultimately how do we get them to, you know, with their quality teams, figure out, you know what? It's when the temperature is less than 15 degrees Fahrenheit for more than 12 hours along this shipping lane that's when I have an issue. We get great. We actually capture that in this structure we call risk profile. And what do we do with it? We create what we call a risk score. So on a scale from 1 to 25, a little bit of a nod to the you know, Richter scales and Saffir-Simpson and so forth, 
It's not super high resolution, that's not the point, but it's a green, orange, red system if you see our company logo. Uh, you'll see the colors there. Really easy for a transportation person to get. There's green, which means the coast is clear. Orange, exercise caution. Red, you need to take some kind of action. And we use that system on a per asset basis and a per lane basis, mile by mile. So we'll tell them how many miles of a shipping lane are currently within or without those parameters that you care about. Are you coast is clear or are you not? And that way guys like Hershey can say, you know what, we can ship this to Arizona, it'll make it there. If we put enough ice packs in it, it'll be there when they get home and it won't be a big puddle. Um, and so out of that, we create these data products. So we already talked about APIs. You know, this is what we're creating. We started from a very uh, user-centric focus, so applications and maps was our initial delivery. Um, but we got more into spreadsheets and then more into APIs and opening up our APIs for our customers, which feeds back into those segments and creates that loop we talked about. I'm going to give you a few examples here. Um, go through these quickly. We have also had to learn in going to a uh, very simple market, if you will, at least in terms of weather and weather data, what do we ask for and how do we get, how do we get to an, a system that works? So scanning a client network. So we'll take in 500,000 shipments from a, from a CPG. We'll look at those over 12 months. We'll say what percentage of those were inside a range that you could have shipped less expensively. Uh, what percentage of those were outside that range? And we'll actually say you are over or under spending. Now you've got the attention of the VP of transportation because you can save him a lot of money, whereas before that, you know, he was just, it was just all numbers to him. We create that risk profile we talked about, and we say in this particular case, we're going to automatically suggest whether we use a temperature controlled unit or blankets or dry, meaning we're just going to trust ambient conditions are conducive. Um, we then work with them through maps and applications to make sure that they get those recommendations on, a, on an ongoing basis. We can integrate with TMSs, transportation management systems, to automate that. Monitor the execution through those IoT uh, products we talked about, and then refine, you know, feed that back into the system to say, well, you shipped it with a, with a blanket. This is how the temperature of that product or that food, we mentioned food here earlier as well, how that temperature of that food internally changed. You could probably be a little more aggressive next time, or maybe next time actually you got so close to the borderline there that you know, if the conditions change, you want to use a, a temperature controlled unit instead. And of course, um, you know, we are a direct to client uh, cost, uh, customer success group, so we work with them very directly. Here's another example. We call this our shipment level risk scoring. This is always a wow moment in our demos. So what's the risk to my shipment scheduled to depart tomorrow? Um, they tell us when it's leaving, when it's arriving, where it's going, and we output data like this. So we say, you know, a, a lot of these guys are looking at origin destination. They're not even looking at the in-between. <laughs> they're not looking at any of the miles in-between or the waypoints in-between, and they're also not thinking, oh, it's going to sit overnight in Omaha, right? That's the problem I need to avoid. Um, so with current tools, just think if, you, if you've got 10,000 shipping lanes, there's no way for you to do this by checking a, a consumer tool, right? You're not going to check all the origins and destinations. You're not going to check all the miles in between. But something needs to tell your systems automatically that you've got a hot spot or a cold spot that you need to avoid, you know, and, and therefore you need to take, uh, take steps. So um, we offer this through an API. Here's a visualization of it. This is our visuals. So. You know, a lot of people have traffic. We've seen that before. This is weather. And this is actually weather over a 10-day period for this lane calibrated for temperature. So there's 620 miles in this lane that are at high risk. Um, we're in, in, intersecting, you know, GFS and some um, NDFD data as well, um, bringing that in to this forecast. And then we have two ways to look at it. One is I'm shipping so much along this lane that all I just care about is any time over the next 10 days what's going to happen. That's one view. You can, we have a load planner tool as well, we call it, which says, if you leave tomorrow, how is that different than if you leave the day after tomorrow? How is it different than if you pay extra to ship it tonight, right? And, and you see these actually colors change instantly on the screen so that it can see what their options are. And I like to think of it as a little bit like a kayak.com or a Southwest Airfare tool. You know, are you flexible? Um, some of them are flexible, and this red goes to green, and they go, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, I can save $500 per shipment, which, is, which adds up. Here's another one I like to show. This is a top 10 auto manufacturer. This was their... Uh, we just rolled out the tools. So they weren't really using it uh, yet. They weren't trained on it. Um, this shows their behavior of the, uh, okay. This is my last slide. This shows their behavior. This is the day of a storm. And this is them logging in and using the information that they had. After we worked with them for a year, this is actually what happened instead. You can see that five days before the storm now, they're actually using data in a proper way. 
Um, and in this case, avoiding factory shutdowns that are caused because they can't get products from Canada to their plants in Ohio. That's it.